March is my month of Marx. In part one, we learned about labour and class conflict. In this part two, we'll be looking at capitalism's consequences vis-à-vis alienation. As well as being a generally bad time for anybody who worked in a factory, the other thing Victorian England was famous for was machines, automation. And this is going to become very important later in the series. Remember, Marx thought that value comes from labour. A machine, then, for Marx, is like a lump of value, because it takes labour to build one. As the machine functions and wears down, it transfers some of its value to the products it makes. But only labour power can actually generate new value. Machines just store value and then distribute it really quickly. That's why although automation can increase productivity, the products themselves contain less and less labour and therefore are worth less and less. So in the long run, automation should cause profits to fall. Marx thought, anyway, like the labour theory of value, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall is pretty controversial. Part of the reason it's controversial is that capitalism does have safety measures against falling profits, most of which try to drive a wedge between the product's value and the price that you sell it for. So for instance, marking up the price so that it doesn't reflect how much labour it actually took to make the product. Or you could cut wages, or you could outsource to a foreign country to reduce labour costs. Also see monopolies or price fixing. And when those safety measures fail, profits fall too low and you get an economic crisis. Marx thought that crises were inevitable under capitalism, they were actually built into the system. He also thought that eventually the safety measures would fail permanently and capitalism would collapse into socialism. More on that in part four. The common theme of Marx's objections to capitalism is that it has no built-in breaks. Under capitalism, humans won't ever reach a point at which we hardly need to work anymore because most of the jobs are done by machines. Because if nobody's labouring, nobody's generating any profits. And if certain capitalist industries are destroying the environment or killing the workers, well then, as long as they're profitable, ain't no breaks on the capitalism train. The system would have to be changed from outside, like the Victorian factory conditions, which were improved, but not by anything within capitalism, by government legislation. That's why Marx put so much importance on a revolution of the working class. He thought it would be an outside shock to a system that couldn't change on its own. As we'll be seeing later in the series, he may have underestimated capitalism's ability to adapt. But whether profits really do fall, or whether the safety measures are enough to keep them bumped up, Marx thought that the Industrial Revolution should have meant people being set free, because you don't need to work as much anymore when you've got machines to do the jobs for you. But because those machines were being used to maximise profit rather than reduce labour, people were actually working harder than ever. Marx thought that under capitalism, the potential of automation gets wasted. And instead of liberation, we get alienation. Alienation refers both to a socio-economic slash political state of living, but also potentially a psychological state of unfulfillment. The Encyclopedia of Marxism calls it the process whereby people become foreign to the world they are living in. Remember last time the importance Marx placed on labour? Human labour is very important for him because we do it consciously, we plan it out beforehand, and the products we make are the reification of a state of mind. Human labour for Marx is an expression of what makes us special, that rational and creative impulse to take what nature gives us and build on it. Marx didn't think that there's such a thing as a fixed human nature, independent of our socio-historical circumstances, but he did observe that the desire to labour cooperatively is common to all human societies. He called this our Gattungswesen, or species essence, and he thought that under capitalism that species essence gets corrupted and turned against us through the processes he called alienation. Marx identified four kinds of alienation that arise under capitalism. The first is the alienation of labourers from the products they make. This occurs when labourers make products that don't fully belong to them. So for instance, you might work in a clothing factory but be unable to afford to wear any of the nice designer clothing that you're making. This occurs because labourers are paid less than the value of what they make. As we said last time, the surplus value is channeled away from them and passed on up to the capitalists. The second type is the alienation of labourers from the act of labouring. This occurs when labourers are coerced or forced or not working on their own terms. They're not 
working because working is the expression of some need, but because it's a means to getting what they need through attaining wages. It also occurs when they can't decide how the product is sold or applied. So for instance, if you have to work a job that you don't like making money for somebody else or starve, Marx thought what you're experiencing there is alienation from the act of labouring. The third is alienation of labourers from other labourers. Marx thought that under capitalism, labourers would be encouraged to seek what benefits them individually, wages, rather than what benefits them mutually, which might be much larger social change. Hence the famous slogan, workers of the world unite. One Western example of this might be the way that some sectors of the white working class have historically viewed working class immigrants not as people in the same boat as them struggling to make ends meet, possible allies in a fight for social change, but as competition for employment, which is what capitalism makes them. The fourth kind is the alienation of labourers from their Gattungswesen, their species essence, and this goes back to what Marx thought human labour was for. Under capitalism, you work to generate profit for somebody else, or you starve, rather than work to generate surplus value for yourself. You do discrete, separate jobs, rather than work on what you want to, because that's the way profits are more easily generated. You do this for hours not set by you, and for most of the time that makes up your life, rather than direct your life the way you want it to go. You produce value, but you're prevented from sharing in it. Marx thought that just wasn't what a good human life is. But isn't all of Marx's whining about the evils of capitalism just misguided? I mean, it's not like under feudalism everybody was happy and nobody worked. You start to work or starve then, and even if we automated as many jobs as we could, there are some jobs that are still going to have to be done by people. Well, we're going to touch on a few of those questions in part four, Beyond Capitalism. That's the end of part two. You've learned about capitalism's problems, including alienation. In part three, we'll take a little bit of a holiday from the dense theory and learn about cultural Marxism. If you'd like to know more about how alienation works, I wrote an article on it for Novara Media that you can find a link to below. It applies Marxist alienation theory to the business of being a YouTuber and the economic struggles that you might have seen some YouTubers going through recently. Speaking of economic struggles, I have a Patreon page. If you would like to support me giving away free education on the internet, kind of education that you might normally have to pay for at a university, then please do feel free to chuck a few dollars my way. I'd really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.